In the last video, I asked you to do a five to 10 minute exercise where I wanted you to go through the detailed table of sections in the Income Tax Act. Specifically, I wanted you to look at part one, division B, subdivision A, B, C, D, and E. I wanted you to get a sense of what are the different sections in those subdivisions. In this video, I'm gonna do some of that with you. So let's get to it. Grab the ITA and turn it to its side. Go to the detail table of sections. Flip to the first page and let's get at it. What I'd like you to take a look at is part one is labeled income tax. And then in division A, there is section two, which talks about the liability for tax, tax payable by persons resident in Canada, taxable income, and tax payable by non-resident persons. Then division B moves on from who's liable for tax and actually talks about the computation of income. Income is a figure that we'll use to help calculate someone's overall tax liability. It begins with the basic rules, and the basic rules for the computation of income consist of section three, income for taxation year, and section four. Section four, you'll notice, has four subsection one, two, and four subsection three. It has different subsections. Now division B is broken down further into different subdivisions. And looking at subdivision A, income or loss from an office or employment. What do you think the sections in subdivision A talk about? That's not a trick question. If you answered the income or loss from office or employment, you would be correct. Section six, right before that, it actually says the word inclusions. Now, an inclusion in income tax refers to amount that is being added to the computation of income calculation. Okay, it's a positive number if you wanna think of it that way. Section six has a number of different subsections and paragraphs in it but we can look at a few of them. Six subsection one says amounts to be included as income from office or employment. And subsection one is broken down further into paragraph A, the value of benefits, paragraph B, personal or living expenses, paragraph C, directors or other fees, and on and on and on it goes. If you were to flip the page and get to subsection seven, you would see 7.1 talks about the agreement to issue securities to employees, better known as stock options. In other words, you're gonna get used to the fact that if you start to look for what is included in income for an individual's employment, you're gonna look at subdivision A. Specifically, you're gonna look at section six and section seven and the subsections therein. Now we can move on to looking at some of the deductions in subdivision A. In other words, what can be deducted from the income calculation with respect to somebody's income from office or employment? Deductions begin with section eight, and eight subsection one says deductions allowed. And then that's broken down further into certain specific deductions, such as eight subsection one paragraph B legal expenses of employee. We can look at some other ones. For example, 81H, travel expenses. H.1, motor vehicle travel expenses. I, dues and other expenses of performing duties. J, motor vehicle and aircraft costs. And we'll be looking at some of those deductions over the course of the term. Let's take a look at subdivision B. Subdivision B is where the income or loss from a business or property rules are generally found. The basic rules begin in section nine. Then we can see the inclusions begin in section 12. You can see things such as 12.1b, amounts receivable, 12.1c, interest. These are things that would be included in a taxpayer's income from a business or property. Where do the deductions begin? If you said a section 18, you would be correct. And 18.1 is a general limitation, 
And then 18.1b is where we get into a specific capital outlay or loss. If you go to section 20, it'll say deductions permitted in computing income from business or property. And you'll see things like 20 subsection 1 paragraph C, interest, or something like 20 subsection 1 paragraph P for bad debts. Let's look at subdivision C. What section does subdivision C begin with? If you said section 38, you would be correct. And subdivision C is where the concept of taxable capital gains and allowable capital losses are dealt with. Where does subdivision D begin? The answer would be section 56. And subdivision D relates to other sources of income. Finally, subdivision E. Where does that begin? Subdivision E begins in section 60 and relates to deductions in computing income. Deductions not already mentioned, that is. For example, if you were to look at 60, paragraph I, we see premium or payment under RRSP or RRIF. Registered retirement savings plans are definitely something we discuss in taxation, but a lot later on. If we don't get to it this term, we'll actually cover it next term. But a lot of you probably already know that some of you are eligible to contribute to a savings account and you can deduct some of that to save taxes. So as we progress throughout the term, you're going to start to get a much better idea of what is in subdivision A, B, C, D, and E in division B, part one of the Tax Act. You might also remember from the last video how I kept saying the detailed table of sections for the Income Tax Act is not a table of contents. And that's because it isn't, right? It's just a listing of all of the sections and what they're named and where they are in terms of are they in Part 1 of the Income Tax Act or Part 2? Are they in Division A, Division B, Subdivision B, Subdivision C? Like that sort of organization is what you'll find there. That doesn't mean there isn't a table of contents in this green monster. Don't, don't call it a green monster, it's the ITA. Forget that I ever said green monster. Now, if we are to open up the book and flip to, I don't know, the first, second, maybe third actual page, you'll see something that actually says table of contents, and there are page numbers in it. Now, your page numbers and my page numbers will be different. If you're using a physical income tax act, I'm using an old one that I just found lying around my house you are probably using one that is more up to date. So the page numbers will be different, but what I want you to find is still relevant. Take a look at the table of contents. I want you to scroll down until it says tax reference tables. In my version of the tax act, it says in Roman numerals, it's on page XXVII. That's 27 in Roman numerals. If we flip to that page in my tax act, It'll look similar in yours. We get to a page that looks like this, tax reference tables. The tax reference tables, the first page of it, is its own table of contents. And I want you to go to the very first reference table. So flip the page one more time. And then you get to the tax reference tables for individuals and you are seeing the federal and provincial income tax rates in brackets. My tax act is current to May 2019, so the rates that you'll be using for your course will be keyed to some other date. So don't use the ones that you see on the screen right now, but you at least know where to go find those rates if you're using the physical book. Again, if you're using an online version of the Income Tax Act, you might have even more current rates than what's available to you in the printed version. Just make sure the rates that you are using are the ones your instructor wants you to use. So in a future video, we'll spend time working on a question where we actually apply these different tax rates to try to figure out how they end up um, computing taxes payable or how they are used to compute taxes payable for an individual. But that'll be in a later video. In the next video, I want to spend more time taking a look at the organization of the Income Tax Act. We'll spend more time talking about how it's organized and how those different rules for including amounts and deducting amounts from income, how they are ordered, 
It's something called the ordering rule. We'll spend a lot of time in that with the next video. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.